afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to welcome you to our session today on revolutionizing Africa's creative supply chains. My name is Aparupa Chakravarti. I serve as director at Botho Emerging Markets Group, and I will be your moderator today. It is my immense honor to introduce you to our four outstanding panelists who are doing some really incredible work to transform Africa's creative and cultural industries, or CCI for short, because that's a bit of a mouthful. So we have with us today, Emanuela Gregorio, who is an economist currently spearheading the African Development Bank's engagement targeting the continent's creative industries through the flagship initiative called Fashionomics Africa. Fashionomics Africa is supporting the growth of women and youth-owned and led SMEs across the African fashion industry. Welcome, Emanuela. Next, we have Derek Ashong, an Emmy-nominated TV host and producer, a Billboard-recognized hip-hop songwriter, and a pioneer in producing multi-platform interactive content for global audiences, having worked with the likes of Oprah Winfrey and Steven Spielberg, among others. He's a creator and host of Take Back the Mic Africa and founder of AMP Global. <clears throat> also with us today is Jude Abaga, popularly known as M.I. Abaga, a recording and performing artist and entrepreneur. I'm sure at least some of us, including myself, are fans of his music. Um, Jude has released 10 projects and won multiple international local awards, cementing his place as a veritable African music icon. He is a former CEO of the record label Chocolate City Music and CEO and founder of Task Agency, which is a creative community that seeks to create change through amplifying ideas. And last, but most certainly not least, we have Samuel Mensa, the founder and CEO of Kisua, which is a unique fashion brand that takes inspiration from traditional African techniques and materials blends them with the contemporary design aesthetic and ethical production methods to create styles for the modern professional. Kisua boasts the likes of Beyonce among his Rolodex of clients and the company won best emerging African brand in 2015's Best Brands Africa Awards. So welcome all of you. Now that I have introduced the panel, I would just like to take a couple of minutes to set the stage for why we're here today. I think COVID-19 was an incredible reality check for those of us who may have underappreciated the value and power of creative industries. When the world was reeling from curfews and lockdowns and cessation of movements and restrictions on social gatherings, and unfortunately we're facing the same limitations as, a second, as we're in the midst of the second wave, what did we turn to? We turned to movies and books and TV shows and art. And even aside from the intrinsic value of entertainment, let's talk about some numbers. Globally, the CCI industry earns revenues of over $2 trillion, employs over 29 million people. In North America, the CCI industry earns over $600 billion, employs close to 5 million people, and accounts for over 3% of the region's entire GDP. If you look at Asia Pacific, it's even bigger, $750 billion in revenue, over 13 million jobs, and again, 3% of the region's GDP. Now, come a little closer to home. Collectively, Africa and the Middle East, their CCI earns revenues of just $58 billion, employs a little over 2 million people, and accounts for just 1.1% of regional GDP. That said, today, we're not here to talk about what African countries should do to create creative industries that are similar to other parts of the world, as impressive as they may be. Rather, we want to talk about what does the African CCI need to do to change the game completely and create an environment where every creative, whether you're a musician, a DJ, a producer, a designer, whoever, has the means and the opportunity to become a multi-million dollar business. And we want to talk about this from three angles access, engagement, and money. So in line with the somewhat visionary spirit of the discussion today, let's fast forward by a decade. What could Africa's CCI sector look like in the year 2030? And so we have in front of us, Alan, maybe if you could make it full screen. Um, thank you so much. So we have in front of us a mock-up of a hypothetical front page news cover story from the year 2030. The Global Times and they're, all they're talking about is Africa, Africa CCI, Africa fashion, Africa whatever. And I wanna turn over to my panelists now. 
And I want to hear your reactions to this hypothetical front page cover story. African creatives blow up micro entrepreneurship. How tech and community launch Africa's tsunami of creative billionaires. And I want to know what do you think this means in the context of your work today? And how realistic or unrealistic, as it were, do you think this vision is based on where you see CCI in Africa headed today? So, keeping your responses to a minute or less, I would like to start with you, Derek. You want me to set the example of a minute or less? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, this is risky business, but, um, but I will do my best. Thank you, Aparupa. That was a wonderful way to set the stage. I think that it is eminently realistic. I think that one of the things that we're focused on in our business is how do you actually create business models that increase digital inclusion? And what winds up happening is you look at like certain big markets, your startup in India, you want to raise capital for your business. Hey, my market is 1.3 billion. You go doing the same thing in China. I got 1.4 billion. You come to do it from Africa and they're like, where are you from? Lesotho. Oh, I mean, me, I'm, I'm in, I'm in uh, Ghana. I'm doing a little bit better, but it's only 25 million. What we need to look at is how do you connect the continent? And we have an initiative to take Africa from 7% 4G penetration to 70% by the end of 2025. And we're collaborating with a number of big institutions in doing so. And if you take those kinds of infrastructural um, steps to actually create a, a, a continent-wide market, you actually have the opportunity for lots and lots of different kinds of entrepreneurship and creativity to scale. And it's that ability to reach scale that is gonna transform the CCI ecosystem uh, within the continent. Then we talk about how we export those creative industries and what you see here becomes a reality. Awesome, thank you. And that was actually a minute, well done. Emanuela, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you so much for having me. And it's really a pleasure to be with uh, this uh, panel of creatives. I'm not a real creative here, so I'm an imposter, but I'll do my best. Eh? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's completely realistic, right? We all agree on that. But uh, what needs to be done is that they need to be given the means to be able to become uh, such billionaires and achieve this, this vision. Um, African creatives, we, we all agree that in Africa, is, Africa is full of talent. Uh, it might be possibly the largest and most diverse pool of talents in the world. However, they face challenges that are different from other regions that keeps them in the formal sector. So until we don't support these entrepreneurs to emerge in the formal economy and grow their business, it will be very difficult to achieve such uh, bold vision. Uh, it's important to note that uh, Africa has the highest rate of entrepreneurship in the world. Uh, where one in five are starting a business. And this is also uh, a proof of the great talent and the resilience of African entrepreneurs, because also there is, lack, there is lack of formal employment. If you think about it, uh, each year there are 30 million people entering the workforce and only 3 million formal jobs are catering for them. Um, mm -hmm. COVID-19 pandemic, as you mentioned, also uh, taught us that uh, is, uh, going digital is not anymore uh, an option, but it's a must. And there is proof, uh, evidence, especially when it comes to the fashion industry, where we are specialized on uh, when it comes to creative industries, that uh, those that manage to go online, they manage to survive compared to those that operate offline. So technology and digital in, uh, in transformation are helping entrepreneurs, um, regardless of the hurdles and the structural uh, um, issues related to technology, so, to infrastructure development support, but going digital is really helping them to reach more markets, increase their sales. So I think this is the way to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Manuela. Sam? Emanuela said it all, really. Um, there's, very, very, <laughs> there's very little to add, um, except perhaps um, an example of um, how um, digital technologies are helping uh, designers across Africa um, engage with customers around, around the world. Mm. Uh, and uh, and so there's, there is an abundance of, of talent on the on the continent. There's an abundance of creative talent. Now the challenge that um, designers face uh, in the fashion industry is having market access, and then also having the capital to be able to fulfill um, the demand when, uh, when when it is there. 
so many stories about African designers having um, orders and not being able to fulfill this due to due to a lack of capital. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, 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 uh, the combination of um, of technology that enables um, designers to access markets, uh, as well as the ability to access capital to be able to fulfill uh, those uh, those customer orders are are, are important. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Ju, last but not least. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything more to add. I think they've, the other <laughs> panelists have all spoken very well. Um, I will say that, um, you know, in the frame of the question, you consider whether, you know, this future is realistic or unrealistic. I think that for Africa, uh, one way that entrepreneurs have to think about is that we have no choice. Uh, but to to do what it takes to get it, you know, to get Africa there, because the cost of not arriving there with with all the macroeconomic forces that are, you know, pressing on Africa with population growth, with uh, you, I mean, all those things. Um, our focus has to be to do what it takes to to get there, and and so within that context, I'm so excited to be here, and you know, I echo all, everything that the other panelists have said. Well, first of all, I think it's awesome that nobody was like, uh, Aparupa, that just sounds like crazy talk. So that's awesome. <laughs> I'm really glad that no one took that conversation in that direction. Um, and now that we've sort of set this really, really exciting vision, I want to bring it a little bit closer back to 2020. And I want to start with our first theme for today, which is really around access. What are some of the, what are some of the tectonic shifts that are, that might already be underway on the continent or that still need to happen to to really sort of generate real access in the sector. And by access, I mean sort of across the gamut, right? So access to data, access to information, access to technology, platforms, markets, the whole, the whole spectrum. And so Sam, I'd like to start with you on this one. This headline that we see here, buy today, receive tomorrow, is really about your platform, Anansi. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing to change the face of e-commerce for African designers today? So we started off a few years ago um, with, um, with our own fashion brand. And it was, a, it was a real learning experience. It was a baptism of fire. Um, we got to understand firsthand the challenges that uh, an African designer faces uh, taking a brand from the continent global um, and, and, and a brand that you know, doesn't manufacture in, in Asia, uh, but manufactures in Africa. So uh, you know, creating jobs, of employment opportunities on the continent and then, uh, and then serving local markets and serving international markets. Uh, and technology was a big part of how we were able to do this. Uh, we were able to sell using um, our own e-commerce platform to uh, customers all over the world. Uh, and so the natural evolution was, okay, how do we take this thing that we have built for ourselves and how do we scale that out to enable many, many more uh, talented uh, African designers to do business with, uh, with the rest of the world? And fundamentally, uh, what we see is uh, we see that there's a, there's a market failure. The market has failed in the sense that there is strong demand for African creative talent. Uh, you know, you just need to look at um, celebrities all over the world, magazines, fashion magazines featuring African designers, African designers um, showing on some of the major stages, uh, fashion show platforms, New York Fashion Week, et cetera, around the world. Um, and yet we're not, we haven't yet translated that into commercial um, revenue, money in the pocket for, for designers. And, and that's where, you know, our, our platform comes in is that uh, we solve a lot of the problems that make the market fail. Um, the problems around, around payments, uh, the problems around, we all know how difficult logistics can be in Africa. You know, how do you get... Um, an item from one part of Africa to another part of Africa or to another part of the world. And then there's also um, the, the, the marketing of Africa um, and the, the marketing of products that are made in Africa. The, the visual presentation, um, mm. the building uh, reputation for making good quality products that is, that is well presented. So these are some of the um, challenges that you know, we encountered ourselves as a business with our own fashion business and through our platform, um, we're bringing some of these solutions to uh, designers across Africa. That's awesome, that's awesome. It's really like, a, it's a super multifaceted approach. It's, it's amazing. And actually to your point about some of these sort of 
more more structural challenges one another major one is really data right and, and that the, all these information yeah. needs to be after we see on the continent and Derek you're really working towards democratizing data access in your industry not just data from an information standpoint but from an actual like mobile data standpoint which I think is incredible can you tell us about how this is working in practice a little bit and what you're trying to achieve yeah, for sure. I, I must say a, a slight criticism. I was going to read the um, my notes from the the, the the image, and then I see it says Lorem Ipsum Dolor. And so I don't know what to say. I have to apparently think I'm on my feet. I'm so disappointed. I'm so disappointed. I was like, this article is great. Wait. Um, no, but in all seriousness, I think that the, the data, the mobile data thing is a big issue. And I think there is a simple answer. Um, it's maybe easier said than done, but I'll give you an example that I like to use because it helps people realize why I look at something like this. I'm like, this is realistic. So what do you think from the media industry perspective about really successful industries or products? Let's look at television and radio for a second. Why did television and radio become ubiquitous media technologies? Because in a nutshell, all you had to do was buy the box. Once you bought the mm -hmm. box, the content came for free. Then you mm -hmm. look at our uh, mobile sector. And what happens is you have to buy the box. Then you have to buy the bandwidth to be able to use the box. Then you have to afford the Netflix subscription, which will eat the bandwidth you just paid for on your expensive box. And literally it is an investment every single time you want to engage and consume online. And it's highly problematic. Um, I feel it very deeply because I was living in Hollywood and I chose to move back to the continent. And I'm just thinking about even my, I chose to get like a regular sort of structure so I could see how my consumer will feel. And it's mm. absurd how many times I'm doing something and then I've run out of data. So <laughs> what we need to do is literally build an ad supported data model, just like mm. what has been done for television, just like what's been done for radio, just like what has enabled these technologies to reach billions of people around the world. In Africa, we have great mobile penetration, but it's 2G, 3G. To get into rich media consumption, which enables us to have more economic value generation, we have to make it affordable for people to do that. And the, the trick is people will say, well, it's a chicken and the egg because people don't have enough free cash to really be able to spend to support you know, these enterprises that are gonna hire more people and pay them better and give them more disposable income. I'm like, if you increase the access, the creators, the purveyors of those businesses, those services, those goods, et cetera, will all benefit. And so will the local and market. So our primary focus uh, in terms of how we impact and create the market around what we do is to build that ad supported data model and to scale it continent wide. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, June, you work with creatives directly and I would love to understand a little bit more about how is task agency providing access today in a way that media agencies on the content continent may not be doing so necessarily now? Um, thank you. Um, so we have a background, just to explain, I have a background in the entertainment industry, come from the music business. And uh, the problem that we identified was that um, we were always spoken to as just creatives, you know, and the end of marketing plan or whatever at the end of the coming and say this is your role we want you to hold this placard or read this script and um when 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 we started task our idea was our understanding was that the job of marketing today is really about leveraging culture and that um you're sort of fighting this part of our evolutionary inheritance that wants to just do things that have been successful in the past and on many levels you know, you're fighting an industry that's trying to recreate, you know, success is sort of the mad men glory days of advertising where you could interrupt people or you could just spend big. Um, but so many things have changed, right? One of those is that the tools of, the tools of influence today now almost, almost completely are on these platforms that users can use directly and then become marketing firms themselves, right? And so as an agency, we, we see ourselves as, 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 as just to come and sit in the cockpit and see see what's happening in culture 
and then trying to guide them to have an open conversation. And that's what, that's what we say. We want you to have an open conversation with culture. And an open conversation means that you listen and it means that you take feedback. You take feedback about, about your product. You take feedback about your messaging. You take, take feedback about your, your company's values. Um, and, and really for us, that's, that's what we see now. It, it sounds easier. I mean, I, I, worrying from what uh, Derek said, sometimes these things are easy to say, but hard to do because a lot of organizations, a lot of corporate companies are sitting in a place where they, we've done this thing right for, for many years. But um, whether it's just looking at technology and see how that's changing people and watching how Gen Z and millennials have, have you know, different patterns of behavior, you can tell that the world is changing. And a task, we really pride ourselves at being able to guide organizations to sit and have a truly open and honest conversation with culture. You know, that, that to us is what, what sustainable access looks like. That's, that's awesome. I, I, love, I love this thing that you said about the job of marketing today is really about leveraging culture. I think, I, I think that's bang on the money. And what I love so far about all the things that you've said are you've, you've really covered the spectrum. And, and by you, I mean all three of you who've spoken so far of, of the, the hard and the soft elements of all of the things that play over here, whether it's logistics, whether it's data, whether it's culture. And these things, it's really the interplay of all of these things that, that create an industry, especially one such as the creative industry. And along those lines, going a little bit more to the to the harder elements of it. Um, Emanuela, I think one of the, from my understanding, one of the key things that fashionomics, um, AFTB fashionomics is trying to address is this thing around market intelligence, right? So the fashion industry on the continent is a buzz with activity, but for investors, especially who are trying to sort of understand the space and, and get a sense of like where, where these tangible opportunities are, sometimes that information and that market intelligence is really not always apparent or visible in a way that's helpful for them. What are some of the ways in which fashionomics and AFDB in general is trying to address some of these gaps around market intel? Um, so, you know, market intelligence and access to relevant information is one of the components of the program. No, uh, through the to, to fashionomics Africa, we are trying to really uh, recreate uh, the ecosystem for the fashion entrepreneurs to to, to thrive and grow and grow their businesses. And we do this through access to finance, access to relevant information, access to capacity building programs, uh, mentorship, networking, and access to markets. And uh, when it comes to the market uh, intelligence and access to data, we have developed an online platform that you can find online and you can register for free. Uh, called Fashion with Africa Digital Marketplace and also a mobile app that you can download um, where we provide access to this information. So uh, we create the databases of uh, entrepreneurs, suppliers, retailers, wholesalers, financiers, donors, all those stakeholders interested in this, uh, in this uh, industry. Um, we also develop uh, uh, online surveys and market studies to generate primary data about the industry. Because as you know, there is very little data available about the fashion industry. We can apply the same uh, uh, to other subsectors of the creative industry, so of which I'm not an expert, but my colleagues can, uh, can agree with me. Um, but, and also, I would like to raise something that I think we all think, we are all aware that uh, even though there is not enough data to show the potential of the fashion industry as an economic, uh, um, economic sector that brings, uh, you know, uh, positive spillovers to African economies in terms of GDP growth and job creation, uh, we are all aware of it. You know, if you think about African uh, families, they all uh, serve themselves uh, through the services of uh, local uh, tailors to produce their uh, beautiful African uh, dresses and the traditional ones as well. Uh, we know that you have to go through several interactions before you achieve the final result, and sometimes uh, you might not get there. And I think we have all experienced that, especially uh, us uh, living on the continent. And uh, so there is also a lack of uh, uh, standardization, a lack of uh, skills also, technical skills that needs to be improved together with business skills as well, like, which are completely different skills, right? Uh, you might have a lot of talent, but not able to run a profitable uh, business. And also this is also what we're trying to do, to, to support entrepreneurs to develop their business skills. Um, at the same time, another reality is that there is uh, uh, financiers and investors, they don't see uh, these, uh, these businesses as credible because they lack structure, they lack economic assets, the seasonality of their businesses, uh, instable cash flows, and you name it, which uh, again, a lack of data don't help them to 
develop the strategic uh, business plans, but also investors they don't see the return on investment. So if you give investors you know, manageable risks and a clear uh, return on the investments, they for sure they will come and invest in these industries. But there is also this uh, uh, data gap that uh, you know, doesn't allow them to assess the risk towards them. At the same time, the financial intermediaries, they don't understand these businesses, again, because they don't see them as uh, credible, as viable, um, because also they, don't, they lack sectorial knowledge. Now, sometimes financial intermediaries, they consider SMEs as, uh, this, as the same bulk of, uh, of entities, when you have to have a sectorial knowledge of each of them, because they all face uh, different issues. Uh, but also because uh, they lack uh, analytical and uh, suitable risk management and mitigation frameworks for them. So also we work with financial institutions to develop their capacity for technical assistance, but also to support the entrepreneurs to develop their uh, you know, business and financial acumen together with other skills, uh, working with other partners. And I will come back to more in specific on uh, how we do it later on. Got it, got it, thank you, thank you. Um, we've talked a little bit about access, now let's talk a bit about engagement. So you have access and then what? Is access in and of itself enough without fundamental shifts in things like behavior or policy or legislation? How do ecosystem players need to engage with these access points and moreover use them to engage with one another to achieve real systemic change, which is, what, which, which is what each of you guys are working towards ultimately, right? So Jude, I'd like to start with you. What does it mean to have a values-based agency? And how do you see it creating a different type of influencer than what we know today, such that, according to this headline, we can lead into the decade of the Afro African influencer 10 years from now? Uh, great question. Um... You know, when, you, when, when I was writing our, our mission and vision statement, you know, it's easy to write those words. Um, and now I have a true understanding of what values mean. And, and to me, I, I, I would say that values within my context today, being values-based means that you are prepared to be an industry leader and, mm. and, and garner support over ideas that people may profess that they stand but in actuality, simple things as, as being inclusive to have women in senior management, little things like that, right, that are not going to be found in society and people are actually practicing. And so you have to make a decision. You know, if you say we're not going to pay bribes, you're, you're not just writing something into your, your, your vision statement, but you are making a decision to lead in your society in doing this thing. And, and, and with that context, um, I would say that one of the biggest things that, that we have come to, to deal with is the proper valuation of African art, of African creativity. Um, I would say that we psychologically have devalued it over years of, you know, um, uh, um, uh, being told that things that are made on the continent aren't as valuable as things made in the West. And that that is one of the core values that as an organization, when you talk to organizations, you're telling them this thing is amazing and this thing is worth as more as much as 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 the same product, and maybe even more, you know, the, anywhere in the world. And uh, in terms of ask, answering the question about um, the kind of influence that in in ten years and twenty years that we wanna we wanna see on the continent, you know, I, as an as a, as an agency. I feel today that we don't really have control over where culture is going to go. Like we're sort of observers in the flow and, and, and our access point to changing things is just to create success and have people see that this way of doing things is successful and let's, let's do it this way. And so I, I, I sort of think about the music business and how it went from being big studios to being now anyone can make a song on your laptop and how technology sort of drove you know, I, I see Derek smiling, but like now anyone anywhere in the world can make a song, put it on SoundCloud, you know, uh, hit up uh, uh, Derek's platform and, and voila, they're, they're huge. Um, and I say that to say that I think that, that where we want to go, where we want to land is where influencers across the continent are truly powerful, are truly, are truly, you know, truly have 
a knowledge of the technology, also have the understanding of, of what it means to have a corporate relationship, you know, with the corporate world and to, to keep your deadlines to, to, you know, to hit those KPIs. And um, we, we, we're trying to, in everything we do, trying to make sure that the, the, the people on the corporate side respect what the African talents and creatives are doing and value it and pay for it properly. And also tell the creatives, hey, look, there's the world is open to you. Like there's in the future, there's going to be no more record labels in this space. There's going to be no more, you know, big studios that are going to be like a gateway. But when you get there, still make great music. I, I, I don't know if, you know, the analogy makes, the metaphor makes sense, but still make great music, still do great work, still use your influence, you know, for not just to make profit, but, but to, to better our society and to move Africa forward. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it actually sounds like what you're from what you're saying that that in this case value exists at two levels. Values in terms of like an ethos and in terms of an internalization of like this is this is who we are and we take pride in this and then this is how we're gonna shape the narrative and the perception around it. And value also means value, like what is this worth? Um, and the coexistence absolutely. things in terms of engagement. Uh, absolutely. Any African. Sorry, I know that you're going to the next question, but any African creative will tell you. That, that from a values on the values platform, as you sort of, that the first thing that will be hit is what you and your art are worth. And you're gonna have to have some, some sort of internal confidence and strength to be able to say, I'm not gonna take that deal. I'm not gonna let you devalue me. And that's now on the, the, value, the value level, but it really yeah. is connected to a higher value, you know, a value, so, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. you're absolutely spot on there. Yep, absolutely. No, that, no, that's awesome. And I think, I think Sam, you're you're also sort of facing a similar a similar type of um, issue, I, I guess, because you also are trying to onboard a lot of African designers that may not have a level of visibility, or I mean, dare I even say respect, even though they're doing like amazing work where they are, but they don't have the kind of platform that they need to be able to showcase that work that that work in a way that makes sense to external audiences. And you're creating this you know, in some ways, an end-to-end -end platform for the textile and, and fashion industry that's, you know, that covers everything from manufacturing to retail. But it's one thing to have the platform. Is it enough to just have a platform? What do designers need to do themselves that they may not necessarily be doing now that's going to help them optimize that platform for what it's supposed to help them achieve? Great, um, thanks. Thanks for the question. So actually, um, the designers are amazing. And um, they are young, they're vibrant, they're dynamic, um, and, and they have an appetite for, for, for technology, for embracing technology to solve you know, their everyday problems and help um, them make, make, make a living. Actually, the biggest challenge that I see is not on the part of designers is not on the part of the users of the of um, of uh, of the platform so i was listening to when jude is talking about music and you know how effectively technology has democratized the distribution of music um that has happened to some extent with fashion but not to the same extent and, and there's a very simple reason for that so so i love the internet i, I, I mean i think the internet is the uh, is probably my favorite um fashion invention of the last 10 10 years uh, it allows the, you know, our equivalent um, of putting your music on SoundCloud will be designing something, taking a picture of it and putting it on Instagram for the world to see. The difference between music as a intangible product that can be sold digitally and, and fashion accessories and creative products is that these are actually physical products that need to get from point A to point B. Um, yeah. And so, you know, you look at Nigeria, for example, you see the amazing talent that has come out of Nigeria in the music industry, right? Mm -hmm. The fashion designers in Nigeria are just as talented as the contemporaries in music. Unfortunately, because of the nature of their product, they face certain barriers just to transact that somebody who's mm -hmm. selling a virtual product like music um, doesn't encounter. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, a designer is doing e-commerce, um, let's say they're a Nigerian designer, and the garment is shipped um, to somewhere in the world. 
um, and a customer in, let's say, London um, or South Africa or Johannesburg or, or Nairobi now wants to return the product because it's the wrong size or the wrong item was delivered. The customs regime in, in Nigeria um, does not allow for the return, the seamless return of e-commerce products, right? Whereas in, in European countries, they understand that in order for e-commerce to work, you have to allow customers to return things that they buy online that they haven't seen. But, and it's not just Nigeria, it's practically every African country does not have a customs regime that actually, under, that actually accommodates e-commerce, right? And we're in 2020 and we're in the middle of COVID and creatives need to trade, creatives needs to do business. So for me, the biggest challenge when you talk about behavior um, and shift in behavior to embrace platforms and advances and digital technology, I see that as a, a major challenge on the policy side. Um, and, um, and I think that once some of these are done, uh, some of these policies, the, the industry is going, to, is going to take off in a, in a big way. But you know, um, one of my favorite quotes about business and entrepreneurship is from Jack Ma. And, you know, he's basic, he says, you, you shouldn't wait until all the problems are solved, right? Because if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. But these are some of the challenges that we are grappling with um, in, 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 in kind of taking our industry, uh, uh, taking our industry global through, through e-commerce and digital technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, that actually provides a good segue for um, the question I was about to pose to Emanuela. Um, especially since you're saying that the behavioral shift really needs to sit more at a policy legislative level than at the, at the, the individual designer level. And Emanuela, you work at a, uh, across a, a wide range of stakeholders. You work with governments, you work with private sector, you work with multilateral institutions. Can you give us one example of the way in which these actors are engaging with each other that's going to allow for some of these conducive policy or legislative shifts? So uh, a clear example is the Continental African Free Trade Agreement, no? this uh, ambition to create a common market finally for the continent. Uh, and as you know, the, the, the African market size is, uh, is very small because uh, uh, you know, African countries are more busy in exporting raw materials instead of uh, uh, processing uh, finished goods. And uh, uh, the fashion industry is a clear example of uh, how finished goods can be then traded not only locally but uh, also regionally especially because you have a market the size of uh, 1.3 billion people that uh, are uh, uh, you know uh, growing uh, also where middle class is growing has a purchasing power to buy these beautiful uh, items um, as the bank, you know, our mandate is really to support the regional member countries in their development uh, agenda and to stimulate uh, regional integration. And we are the financing muscle for uh, the implementation of this FTA. We do this through infrastructure uh, development investments, uh, provide technical assistance to regional member countries to develop their capacity. We provide long term financing to financial intermediaries because we don't finance directly uh, small and medium enterprises, but we do that through intermediaries. Uh, we invest a lot in uh, trade financing, for example, no, uh, to support financial intermediaries, uh, again, to stimulate. Uh, uh, trade uh, within the African economy. So we, we, we intervene on different levels, but uh, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, even though the CFTA has, is an opportunity to create uh, these uh, concerted uh, efforts of uh, governments, uh, uh, financial institutions, uh, multilateral de development banks and private sector to come together, um, we still, you know, this, this is, uh, CFTA still have to be implemented. And as the Sam said, no, we cannot wait for this to happen. And this is why, again, I would like to insist on the digital revolution that is happening uh, now, that is supporting uh, those, especially those operating in the informal sector to go uh, online and be able to reach uh, uh, other markets. It's true that uh, there is an is issue about the distribution and logistics that needs to be sorted out. Um, but again, uh, this is happening. Uh, and it will, uh, you know, the more uh, it, it grows, the more, you know, we will become competitive, the more actors, the private sector actors will crowd that space and costs will be lowered. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing some questions coming coming in about finance and investments and capital. I know we're all about the Benjamins here, and I promise you we're heading into those questions very, very soon. And before we go there, I just have one last question on the engagement front, and this is for Derek. Derek, Take Back the Mic is more than just a show, from what I understand. It's really, it's really a movement, right? And one that requires people from all over the world to engage and interact. And I want to ask you, from, from in your perspective, what's that one thing that needs to happen to get people around the world to actively co-create and sustain these kinds of decentralized communities that are built around music or fashion or, or art or, or what have you? Okay, so there already are lots of these communities out there. I mean, there are platforms that enable people to engage uh, in lots of interesting and cool ways, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Snap, uh, TikTok, depending on what country you're in and who's your president, uh, which we, uh, US just got a new president, by the way. Uh, it's not officially announced yet, but the numbers have done what they needed to do. So that's why you see me smiling over here. Um, but that's uh, in other news, basically, because you've got these existing platforms, you realize there's lots of ways to build community. The issue is how do you build substance in that community, right? So for example, if I put out a video online, I got 12 million views, hotness. Okay, here comes the next video. How do I reach the 12 million people, right? I can't. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, they'll tell you me how many people watch. They won't tell me who they are. And so our interest is how do you build a model where you have actually deeper data, more um, powerful, more influential data that at the same time represent or respects the values of the consumer, the privacy of the consumer, not simply turning them into uh, a product that you could sell to third party uh, advertiser or whatnot, but rather let their data be at the center of their world and build relationships with them and enable content creators and content consumers to build direct relationships with each other. That's what Take Back the Mic is about on a technical level. It literally is an architecture for how do you have more effective data, uh, uh, and by that I mean analytics in this context, as sharing of analytics and information and recognition of the people who make movements happen. On a conceptual level though, when we say it's a movement, it really is about, you know, when I, I love when MI was talking about values. On the one hand, there's that element of value and perceived value. And we run into the issue of you see Africa and you assume it must be less than. What if it's the best? I mean, we already come in with a discount because of people's perception of what you are, what you bring, who you are. Whether you're an artist or an entrepreneur, you're an investment banker, they see your name, here comes the discount. So that's one issue we have to address. We need to deal with how do we improve the perceived value of all things African, right? Um, but then the other thing is on a values perspective, how do you build a business that really has the ability to impact people? And that's where this movement component comes in, where we're thinking, okay, at the end of the day, there's an entire generation that wants to be heard and heard in authentic ways and be centered in the value that they create and benefit from it. Well, if you keep that in mind and you put those people at the center of your strategy, then you can actually build a business that helps people amplify their voices and the voices of their communities. And that is what enables you to now start talking about scale worldwide. It's not just, here's a really talented kid in Ibadan who's hoping to get heard around the world. It's like, oh no, there are simple tools that the entire community to help that young person be seen across Nigeria, across West Africa, or across the continent, across the world. And that is what we mean by movement building. It starts with knowing your audience and then building a relationship with them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Speaking of knowing my audience, um, before I go into our third theme, which is around finance, um, if audience members, I would like to leave a little bit of time towards the end um, for Q&A. So if audience members have any burning questions for our panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A box and we will, we, will feel those, we will feel those questions towards the end. So there's, just wanted to put that out there. So money, let's talk about money. We've talked about access, we've talked about engagement, we've, talking, we've talked about structural issues, you know, build, building these incredible communities. How does this all generate money? And so Emanuela, I'd like to start with you and I'm, I'm being time checked guys. So we have, we, do, we only have a few minutes to go. So if you could limit your responses to maybe a minute, sorry. <laughs> so I'm looking at this headline, AFCFT is real MVP, CCI sector now 35% of intra trade blown up 
In what ways is the African Development Bank deploying funds strategically to unlock greater intra-African trade for Texans in apparel or maybe even the CCI space in general? So as I mentioned before, no, this is really the late motive of uh, our work. We uh, invest in the whole ecosystem that uh, uh, supports the creation of uh, regional integration and a common market for the continent. And we do this in various ways. So we provide, uh, uh, you know, we support to project finance uh, our regional member countries or uh, private sector uh, um, uh, entities that they intend to expand or set up new production facilities in African countries. An example of our public uh, sector investments is in Madagascar, when we invested 10 million in the textile and clothing industry, supported the government to develop this industry because it's, uh, it's, Madagascar is one of the uh, top 10 uh, export-oriented, apparel export-oriented uh, countries. Um, we are invested in, uh, in 40 private equity funds that uh, also target uh, cultural creative industries and uh, textile uh, sector. Uh, I'm thinking of the Alitia investment fund that also Sam uh, knows very well because it's a, it's a fund that's been created by the bank, uh, uh, the anchor investor we, with 12.5 million and through which we are mobilized uh, up to 80 million uh, to be invested in uh, SMEs operating in various sectors, including creative and cultural industries with a focus on women owned and led businesses. And this is the only the, the only existing uh, fund uh, in the on the on the continent that is managed by women fund managers. So just to tell you what's all the innovation that we put into our work. Um, our uh, initiative also now we are uh, partnering with the World Bank, uh, with the Women Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative. Uh, we are working with the Flexi Bank also that they have recently launched the creative uh, uh, program uh, not to support creative entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, we are funding members of the Flexi Bank. Uh, we have helped to, to set up this uh, bank uh, focusing on trade finance mainly. Uh, so you see, uh, we really work with various partners development partners as well as their other regional development banks, but also with the private sector. Uh, with the private sector, now, for example, we work with Google, with Facebook, uh, with uh, Parsons School of Fashion in New York, uh, with uh, UN agencies uh, in uh, developing the capacity of the fashion entrepreneurs when it comes to uh, ethical sourcing, uh, circular economy, digital tools uh, that can help them to boost their, uh, uh, their business. Because we don't intend to do this uh, by ourselves because we don't have the capacity for this. But you see, uh, just to, I'm saying this because to give you the idea how we work with different uh, strategic public and private sector stakeholders to support the, 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 the build up of an ecosystem for them to thrive. Yeah. Sorry yeah. for uh, exceeding the one minute. It's okay, you're forgiven. It was a good answer. <laughs> Derek, what's it gonna take AMP Global to become the first African media tech firm to top the Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2030 or sooner? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we're launching a uh, a new format uh, called the Mike Africa. It's part travel show, part music competition show, fully interactive, the audience cast and curate it. It will be the first format that is born in Africa, exported to the world. So our X factor, so to speak. Uh, that goes live on December 6th uh, with the audience of 100 million or reach initially of 100 million people. Then we will launch the Mike India and the Mike Asia next year, uh, as well as the second season of the Mike Africa. We are going to acquire 100 million users in the next 12 months through these digital services. And the beauty of what the technology does is it enables our media partners, our distributors, to actually be inside of the platform and leverage this powerful tool sets that all our little, you know, our PhD computer scientists from Google have built. And what happens is once they've realized the capability, the capacity of it, and then through our social initiatives, we're getting more people online. Now you have this incredible marketplace where African creatives and creators and media outlets are finding a place where they can all exchange. And by doing so, we leverage our full $1.3 billion billion person potential, as well as marketing to the rest of the world. And that's how we become a very big public company that hopefully is a catalyst for more creativity across the continent. That's awesome. I hope everyone caught that date, December 6th, guys. Stay tuned. Um, Sam, we've seen the challenges that e-commerce players, players on the continent especially have on the path to profitability. I'm not gonna name any names, but we know, we, we know who they are. 
what makes a nancy difference in a minute or two uh, yeah okay so 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 real quick uh, two things um first we run an inventory light model right so one of the things that can be really expensive about in, about e-commerce is uh, sitting on all that inventory and waiting for it to sell um so where you play the role of facilitator market facilitator uh, basically the grease in the engine that makes the different parts of the engine move that's a lower cost model than what some of the other players uh, you refer to have um have 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 uh, that have implemented then the mm. other major um the other major part of uh, of e-commerce is usually your marketing costs your cost of customer acquisition uh and that has been falling actually quite a bit because of covid uh you know because now everybody realizes and appreciates the um the importance of uh you know using digital technologies to to shop because we can't do it in person um or even when we can we'd rather you know not get sick um by going into malls where there's large crowds so 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 covid has actually accelerated um that um that transition to to do to e-commerce and transition to digital trade and and what that's done is that it has brought down some of the costs associated with acquiring customers because customers themselves are coming to you rather than you having to go and convince them not to go out but to shop online they are now coming to you wanting to shop online um and 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 even after covid you know this is a trend we think will persist because customers uh, covid was the forcing function uh that uh, that 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 made consumers discover uh online uh, uh how the convenience of e-commerce and we think that that will continue into into the post covid era yeah yeah absolutely thank you and then jude as a values based agency we talked a little bit about that already what is task doing to blur the lines between profit and impact and that especially ties in with the overall ethos of you know the sunk up for sunk up for as an impact based forum yeah um there's a uh, i mean after the recent protests uh in nigeria um there are a couple of days of you know uh, hoodlums you know demolishing buildings and there's a store that uh got completely a store chain they got completely destroyed and they put out a tweet and they said the building with a picture of their store you know that's completely ransacked empty windows broken and the tweet went rebuilding a rebuilding a store is hard but building a nation is harder we'll build together or something and the tweet just blew up and um i remember from my time in music that i would i, I would see my job as as convincing the using the pnl to convince the owners of the company to allow me change people's lives right um but that was my real job my real job was to take young artists and young producers and young managers and and give them an opportunity to change their lives and i think that um that's the task that in some way we're all doing we're all doing i have chats with derek all the time and at at the core that's what it's about it's about improving what we're doing and, and so we we're going to play a part a task to to with every organization i mean we're having great conversations right now you know in the aftermath of these protests and a lot of young ceos a lot of young guys are open to the conversations about how they can do both at the same time because ultimately the only reason we're doing the one the only reason why the pnl and 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 all those things are important are because you want to create impact in some way you want to make life for someone better and um so if we can do some at both at the same time then it's it's an absolute win win and for africa i think it's also a necessity at the same time yeah absolutely we have a couple of minutes left and i have uh, i just want to address a couple of questions that are coming from the audience that i think are quite interesting and actually one of them is a great segue to you know exactly what you just said you so someone asks if and and please feel free any of you or whoever that you just jump in are there innovative approaches you have seen or that you are deploying um yourselves to address challenges specifically faced by cci players within disadvantaged communities so emanuela you spoke about the informal sector um whether it's slums or refugees wh whoever that may be that's a free for all guys whoever wants to jump in 
I, I will just quickly come in. Uh, so we do, uh, in everything we do, we always try to see how we can uh, connect uh, um, rural areas, you know, uh, to, to the cities, you know. Every project that we do is not only looking at the primary cities, but also we look at the secondary city, how we can support them in developing. Uh, and also when it comes to fashionomics, uh, we collaborate with uh, the likes of the Ethical Fashion Initiative that they really work in rural areas with uh, uh, cotton farmers to improve their production and so forth. So we don't do it ourselves, but we work with those uh, partners that have the comparative advantage to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Apropo, can I make a comment? Of course. So this question that just came up from Mercy, how do financiers ensure return ROI, especially from up and coming creatives, especially in nascent markets? You know, I'm not gonna give you the successful example. Well, maybe I actually I will, I'll give you a personal example. But I think part of what has to happen is you have to have people investing in each other. So Drew just said, hey, his job was to take money from that PNL to invest in the next generation of creatives. And that is exactly what more of us need to be doing. We need to get away from the big man syndrome, like me, I have arrived, who are you? That's not gonna work for our generation, right? In order for us to really succeed and not everybody trying to get a small piece of a shrinking pie, but to have a big pie. So even if I have a smaller percentage of it, it's still a fatter piece. We need to collectively get in the kitchen and make this thing happen. I'll give you an example of how we see this. We just took a young girl um, from Durban and put her on a billboard in Times Square in New York. To my mm -hmm. knowledge, it's the first time that there's ever been a billboard for an African uh, TV series in Times Square. MI blasted it out to all of his networks, but so did top media companies in Ghana and in Nigeria and in Kenya. We did it together. We told a story together amplifying this concept and the face of one young woman. We've got 17 other young people who are also going to be pushed forward in various creative ways. I think there's a, always an a way that we think about what needs to come from the outside. But in order to get ROI from your investment, you really need to be focused on risk mitigation. And we don't need outside resources in order to do that. We need to leverage the power we already have. If the risk is your creative will never be seen, well, who are the creatives of voices? Let's take that risk out of factor. If the risk is we don't know how to monetize, well, who's already got a supply chain that is monetizing? Let's take that risk out of the equation. And if you do that by leveraging the successes that people are having in their various sectors, all of a sudden, the possibility of getting ROI from CCI in Africa looks much, much more realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, Go ahead, just want to add to the sorry, Apropo, real quick. I uh, just want to add to yeah. the, the the comment about um, about impact and um, and vulnerable communities. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we have this youth bulge in Africa, which um, in many respects is an is an asset, but at the same time, a lot of young Africans um, struggle to find jobs. Um, however, many of these young at, uh, uh, Africans are talented, you know, they have skills, they can make things with their hands, things that they can then sell to, to make a living. Um, and, and, and a lot of these are also, are also women. Um, and with, with, with COVID, we've seen, um, you know, an even greater rise in unemployment across, across Africa as economies have had to shut down to, to contain the spread of the virus. So uh, platforms like ours, make it a real point to work with young people, um, disaffected young people, disaffected uh, women, but, but these are people who have, who have skills, who are talented, who will make a beautiful hat that Beyonce would wear, um, or make a beautiful pair of shoes um, that, will, you know, that could be sold anywhere in the world. They can make beautiful things with their hands, uh, and, and we just need to empower them with the platforms so that they can trade. Um, and, 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 and so, yes, that is a very important point that, you know, we do business to, uh, to do good, to have an impact, not just to make money. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Would, would anyone else like to chime in on either Mercy's question or the, the question around impact before we wrap up? Okay, in that case, 
guys, this is a fantastic, fantastic conversation. I feel like, you know, this, this fake mock-up that we put together the year 2030, it's like around the corner. It's really, it just, it feels like we're on the cusp of something incredible. And it's the not just about, it really is though, right? <laughs> And I want to thank all the panelists. You guys are phenomenal. I can't wait to see what you guys are up to next. Um, hopefully, this is an opportunity for all of you to also co-create and collaborate. You're doing really interesting things in distinct spaces, but there are clear interdependencies. And I also want to thank our audience members. I saw all these like really interesting comments and questions come in. Thank you guys for being so engaged. And this has been wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you so much for having me. me. A pleasure to well i would like to continue the conversation offline with all of you and see how we can collaborate for there because uh, our work is uh, mutually can be mutually reinforcing no because uh, you don't see a, a fashion show without music or a, a movie without people all dressed up right so Amen. let's find Absolutely. a way to collaborate and uh, yeah. instead of uh, you know uh, and put aside competition because we all come from different uh, spaces that there's no competition, but we can only help each other. Amen. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well done, Aparupa. Good. good Thank good, you. Good. Thank you, Aparupa and Boto Group. Uh, it was excellent uh, panel, really. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. <laughs> you too. Right. Peace bye out. Bye. Thanks, bye. everyone. Bye-bye.